All right. So last time we did a, a quick overview, basically, of uh, oh, what all did we look at? The well, we were Daniel 12, 1 through 3, about the, we saw how Satan was cast out of, out of heaven. Daniel, uh, Gabriel took it, not Gabriel, Michael took his stand, had that battle with with Satan at the at the cross and he was cast down to, to earth and then Jesus received his kingdom. He went back to the Father to receive the kingdom and he is going to be coming again to reign on the earth with the saints. Uh, that's in we'll see that in Revelation 19 and 20. But while while he's in heaven, while the king, he is the king, he's we saw the in Acts 1 and in Luke 19, that parable Jesus gave with the nobleman where he went back to a, he went to a far distant land to receive his kingdom, which is Jesus going back to the Father to receive his kingdom. And while he's away, while he's with the Father, he's given us a commission. He's the, the great commission in Acts chapter 1. He, he said it was, were to be his witnesses. In Luke 19, that parable, he says that he's given us these minus to do business with something very valuable or to multiply it the other uh passages on the great commission were to go out and share the gospel make make disciples so that's basically what we we looked at luke 19 last time that was our i guess you'd say that was our focus because that's where we finished and that was if you recall in that parable luke 19 at, at the end when the when the king returns he settles accounts and he's going to separate basically he's going to separate the true believers from the, the false converts i guess you'd say the wicked the wicked servant was a was a false convert he 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 took he hid the the map the mina he did not uh multiply it he did not share it he hid it because he saw the the king as, as a as a the master as a, a hard man a harsh taskmaster he didn't see him as a as a gracious loving father as and a benevolent king as a true believer does he didn't understand god's grace he saw him as uh demanding like it would be like a like a pharisee or a scribe the legalist that see god as a demanding master that demands that we keep these commandments in order to earn somehow earn his acceptance this impossible list of rules and regulations that we can never live up to so they see god as a harsh master and so they're afraid of him we were if we're we're living out of the law we're afraid of the master and we're not going to go out and multiply this mind or whatever he's given us whether it's the gospel his grace his his uh gifts the the resources anything we're not going to multiply it for the kingdom purposes because we we're afraid of him we don't it's not good news to us we don't go out and share this with others so that's going to be the evidence now now uh, it's going to be the evidence that we are that we're a true believer now that's not what's going to save us you know it's trusting in jesus is what saves us doing you know multiplying the resources multiplying the minus the making disciples that's just a a what do you want to call it i guess that would be the fruit of having true genuine saving faith in jesus because he's his love his grace is going to transform us so that's that's about sums it up from last time is that everybody on we're all on board with that all in agreement all right. Um, there was something, a passage I just came across this morning um, related to this. Do you remember in, in Revelation 12 is where we saw that, that battle between Michael and his angels and dragon and his angels and, and the devil was cast out? And it, it, we were pretty certain from, from, math, from Revelation 12 that this happened at the cross because it was, it was right after, let's see, child's caught up to god um that's the ascension and he's kind of repeating here and he says there was a war in heaven michael and his angels waged war with the dragon the dragon and his angels waged war they were there's no longer a place found for them in heaven they was thrown down the great dragon was thrown down the serpent of old deceives the whole world he's thrown down to the earth and his angels thrown down and heard saw in verse 10 now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our god and the authority of his christ have come for the accuser of the, our brethren has been thrown down to accuse them before our God day and night. And it's we were pretty certain that that was happened at the cross. That's that's when salvation came. Well, John, John 12, I think, reinforces that. John 12, 31. This is right before Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. John 12, 31, I think he makes it clear here. 12, 31. This is... 
Um, let's see, this is this is right after Mary anoints Jesus. This is this is six days before Passover. So that final Passover is coming up. Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. Mary, remember, Mary of Bethany anointed Jesus for his burial. And then we have the, the triumphal entry in John 12, verse 12, triumphal entry, which is what we looked at last time. And we saw Luke's version of that triumphal entry. And then, uh, let's see, where are we? He's talking about in verse 27, John 12, 27, he's talking about his death. He's saying, I'm getting ready to go to the cross. He's just days away. He says, but that's that's the purpose I came for. I'm not going to say, Father, save me from this hour. This is the hour I came for, that hour on the cross. It says, you know, Father, glorify my name. And the Father, a voice came out of heaven, says, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again, which is going to happen at the cross, plus it, at his resurrection and ascension. So the multitude heard it, and they thought it was an angel speaking. Jesus said, it, this was not for my sake, but it's for your sake. He wants, wants the people to realize it's the Father speaking, that Jesus is going to be glorified here. And then check out what he says in verse 30. He says, now judgment is upon the world. Now the ruler of this world shall be cast out. So that's the same thing as Revelation 12, isn't it? The ruler of this world is going to be cast out. That's when he's cast out of heaven at the cross. So in any in the very next verse, he says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. So he's saying that's when the ruler of the world is going to be cast out of heaven is when Jesus is lifted up on the cross. So that that ties in with Revelation 12, where where the dragon was cast out out of heaven onto earth at the at the cross. So does that does that make sense? That seem to reinforce that. Okay. So all right. So he was cast out, and Jesus ascends back to the Father, receives his kingdom, and so we yeah we looked at Luke 19, the parable of the minas, where we're to multiply the minas, and then in Acts one. One eight, we're all familiar with that. When, where Luke says, uh, actually, it was Jesus saying that. Luke recorded it. Acts one eight. This is right before the ascension. This is what Jesus says right before he goes back up to the Father. He says, uh, verse one eight. He says, "You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the remotest parts of the earth." And that yeah, you know, that's going to be the, the city you live in, the area, your region, in in the whole world. And then that's right after that, he said he he was lifted up. While he said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking. The cloud received him out of his sight. That's when he ascended back to the Father to receive his kingdom. And then verse eleven says, "Why are you standing there looking into the sky?" He said this Jesus, the one that was just taken up into heaven, he's going to come in the same way. As you have watched him going to heaven, so he's, he went up in the clouds, up to heaven. He's going to come back from uh, from heaven in the clouds, just like he went up. And that's going to be in Revelation 19 when he comes, when the heavens open up and he returns on a on the white horse. He's going to come with his armies, which is the saints. That's you and I, the souls of the saints, clothed in our white robes. If we happen to uh, pass out of this body and be with the Lord be before he returns, and so. So yeah, we're to be his witnesses. And so what what is a witness? What does a witness do? We're to be a witness. If you're called to be a witness in a trial, what do you do? Testify. Talk about what you've experienced. Yeah, testify. Oh, testify what you've experienced, what you saw. What like like the blind man. He didn't see, well, yeah, I guess he, I don't say he didn't see anything, but he did. He, he saw I said once was blind, but now I see. So yeah. Testify what you saw. Testify what what you've experienced. Uh, I once was blind. Now I can see. That, that's kind of hard to I don't know. Kind of hard to argue against that. Although I have had people argue against my testimony, saying, "Oh, I don't believe it." Well, that's that's on you if you don't want to believe it. <laughs> you know, all I know is I once was blind, but now I see. So, yeah. You know, in a courtroom, you're supposed uh, you know it's you're supposed to tell the truth too. Good point. Uh, you know, perjure, perjure yourself. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, good point. I'll tell good. the truth. Yeah, good point. But that's only in the court of law. Somebody yeah. can test, testify outside of uh, court of law and not be held to the truth. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. 
of course, in God's court courtroom, that's even uh, more serious than the court of law, isn't it? So, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. God won't be mocked. So, Amen. They, Amen. There's no, no way to uh, get around that. Yeah. 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 So, all, all we can do is testify what, what we've seen, what we've experienced. You know, Jesus has made me a new creation. He's taken this burden of guilt off of me. I mean, it's, I don't know, just share what Jesus has done for you. He's forgiven me. I no longer have a, he's taken away my fear of death. And, you know, and, and we want, when we're sharing that, you know, we want to put the focus on Jesus. I mean, a lot of times, and I, I fall into that as well. Sometimes, you know, when we're sharing our testimony, sometimes we make the folk, put the focus on us instead of on Jesus. But, you know, we want to keep the focus on Jesus. You know, Jesus took away my sins. Jesus set me free. He's taken away my fear. Uh, he's given me a hope. He's given me a future. He's, He's a living hope. So, yeah. All right. Um, so yeah, in, in in Acts one, when when Luke's making that, uh, Acts one verse two, Luke is saying, until the day when Jesus was taken up, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles. So he gave the orders to the apostles. And he, he tells them right there in verse eight, that's what the order was to be his witnesses. In in Luke's gospel, he, he says it a little differently. Yeah, if you want to turn to the last, it's Luke 24, the last chapter of Luke, which at the book of Acts is, you could almost call it Luke, uh, the, the second book of Luke, because he's it's really just a continuation of his gospel. Because if you read the last several verses of Luke 24, it's it's almost saying the same thing as the first 11 verses of, of Acts chapter 1. So in Luke 24, starting at about, uh, starting about verse 44 to, to 53, he, he says, this is Jesus, speaking of Jesus, he, he's talking about the words I spoke to you while I was with you, everything that was written about in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, Everything, you know, the, everything in the Old Testament is about Jesus, isn't it? But, um, until we have spiritual eyes, we don't see it. But once we receive enlightenment, enlightenment from the Holy Spirit, we understand. We start to see Jesus everywhere in the Old Testament. And uh, so he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Is it reminds me of like how, um, you know, when you fall in love with someone, you know how it is, right? It's that phase where you like you're thinking about that person all the time, everywhere you go, you know, you're, you know, something is related to that person. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> and so I, I feel like it's the same way with Jesus. When you, when you fall in love with him, you get saved. Mm -hmm. It's like your antennas, anything about him, you know, mm -hmm. um, attracts you. Like, even if it's a big crowd, I feel like so, if two people are talking about Jesus, immediately my attention would like you know, go there and I'm like, oh my goodness, they're believers. Like, you know, I can, I can go and, you know, connect with them and that sort of thing. But that never was like that before, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, it was totally like numb and blind. Um, it would just never, ever even like, um, appeal to me. Amen. So it's, a, it's pretty amazing how, um, the change happens. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, that kindred spirit we have because of the Holy Spirit living in us. Yeah, I mean, for, I, and you probably can relate. Yeah, I can relate to what you're saying. You know, before before knowing Jesus, before being born again, if I'd come across two people talking about Jesus, I'd, I'd you know, walk across the street. I don't want to, yeah, don't bother me with that religious stuff. But now you're drawn to that, aren't you? Here, here's somebody talking about Jesus, my Savior, the one I love. I want to get in on this. So yeah, thank, thank you, Sandra. And, and yeah, when, I don't know about the rest of you, but when I'm, whenever I'm looking at the Old Testament, whether it's Daniel or, you know, the Psalms, the prophets, I, I'm always, I'm, all, I'm always looking for, for Jesus. It's, I don't know, it's, I, it, I don't know if it's just like, like a magnet, if I see something, well, like uh, Daniel 12, 3, when he says about those that have insight and lead many to righteousness, well, for leading someone to righteousness, that's Christ, his, his righteousness, his, his is the only righteousness that has, is of any value. So if we're leading someone to righteousness, we're leading them to Jesus, aren't we? We, we become the righteousness of God in him. So, yeah. So, so thank you, Sandra. All right. Um, 
So yeah, Luke Luke 24 talks about, says it's it's written, Christ should suffer, rise again from the dead the third day. I mean, that's basically the, the gospel, isn't it? Christ suffered, he died to pay for our sins. He, he, he was buried, he rose again on the third day. I mean, that, that's what Paul says the gospel is. So if we're sharing the gospel, you know, we tell them Jesus died, he suffered, he paid for your sins. He rose from the dead to, to offer you his life. So that's the instructions were to tell others. Um, and there he says, verse 47, repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem, similar to what he said there in, in Acts chapter 8. And repentance for forgiveness of sins, well, the key there is in his name. You know, we need to make sure we're telling people that it's in his name, in Jesus' name, based on who he is and what he's done that's where forgiveness comes and the repentance is changing your mind that's what repentance is we change our mind um change our mind about how i'm going to get to heaven i'm not going to get to heaven by being a good person i uh, change my mind about about sin that you know that what i'm doing is sinful that i change my mind about you know the the judgment that i'm it's i'm i deserve and then uh believe on jesus in, in acts 19 John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, saying that we are to believe on the one coming after him. So that's what repentance, repentance and faith go hand in hand, don't they? We change our mind. We stop trusting in our own goodness and we believe on Jesus, trust in him, trust in Jesus, that his blood paid for all of our sins, trust that his resurrection is going to give us life. When we receive him, we're going to receive his life. So that's what we're to tell that's the instructions we're to tell people as well we're to tell them to repent change your mind put your trust in jesus to receive for the forgiveness of sins and then verse 49 similar to what he luke told us in acts he said i'm sending forth the promise of my father upon you but you're to stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high that's basically the same thing he said in, in Acts 1.8. You'll receive power from on high when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So don't you know, don't go out and try to do this until you receive power. And that, that's true for each one of us. And, and we did receive power to be his witness the moment we were saved, didn't we? We were we received the Holy Spirit. We were marked in Christ with a seal, a promised Holy Spirit. So if you're a believer now, you know, you you have that Holy Spirit, you have that power to be his witnesses. But back then they had to wait until Pentecost to receive it. And then Matt Matthew's version, the instructions he gave Matthew in in Matthew 28, that's probably the passage we're most familiar with when you when you talk about the Great Commission. That that's where Matthew 28 it's, it's a great commission. I heard a salesman say one time, he, he said he thought the Great Commission was 10% of retail, but uh <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, the Great Commission Jesus is talking about is something a little different. He said, uh, let's see, Matthew 28, starting in verse 18, Jesus came up and he spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That's kind of like what Revelation 12 said when he says he has give, he's been given authority in the kingdom. So he's, he's repeating this here. And this is remember, this is after the cross, right before his ascension. So all authority has been given to Jesus at, at the cross. He received all authority and he's going to go back to the father to receive that kingdom. So all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, similar to what he said in in Luke and, and Acts, all the nations go to you know go to your city, your area, to all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He's going to be with us through the Holy Spirit. Remember in, in John, he says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans, but I'm going to come to you. And he's refer was referring to the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to send, he's a parakletos, another comforter, just like me. So he's with us always now, isn't he? Through the Holy Spirit that lives in us. So we're never alone. Jesus is with us always. So, so that's Mark's version of what we're to do while Jesus is back in heaven with um, sitting on the throne, having received his kingdom. Matthew says we're to make disciples. And then Mark's version, Mark 16, um, Mark 16, 16, we're probably familiar with that one. That's where he said, go into all the, the world and preach the gospel to, to all the, all creation. That's the gospel is the same thing that 
Luke said, Jesus died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised from the dead for our justification to give us life. So we're to go into the world, preach that to everybody. And then verse 16, we're, excuse me, verse 16, we're to tell them whoever believed, whoever has believed in Jesus and has been baptized shall be saved. But he who has not believed shall be condemned. And that baptism he's referring there to is that same baptism that Luke is talking about in Acts chapter 1. It's being baptized by the Holy Spirit. That's what saves us. Because in Luke chapter 1, when he gives that same instruction, he says, he says, John baptized you with water, but one coming after you will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So that's the baptism that Mark is talking about that saves us. We, we believe in Jesus and we're baptized by the Holy Spirit, and then we're saved. If we don't believe in Jesus, we're going to be condemned. Go ahead, Sandra. You have something to to share something to add no i'm just i just wanted to ask you i mean you have way more years of experience as a believer i i got saved in my 20s i'm in my 30s now so um like have you how much like success have you had in sharing the gospel i know that it just burns within us to share want to share it to see mm -hmm. souls um come to christ yeah. but um uh, more so here in America than in India, I've honestly felt like that that success of receptiveness from people and that desire to know uh, more about God and things like that. It's not so much, you know, and I've mm -hmm. I it just sometimes it I'm just being honest, like it really like. I feel stuck, you know, sometimes like I don't know what to do. Like, I mean, people don't. And, and the Bible says the harvest is plenty and all of that like but I'm like thinking it doesn't seem like it like people don't seem to even want to know like if mm -hmm. even if you do share anything about God or you know you share the gospel with someone they seem to just ignore you or they're cold in their response yeah. um and I, I was just wondering if you know since you you are way ahead way ahead in this journey if you have seen otherwise or what's your experience been been like what does it look like for you yeah yeah good question um more often than not i've had the same experience you have where it's been the reception's been cold i'll, I'll share a, an email from last week that was very encouraging where um, i did have the the privilege of seeing someone come to come to Christ. And, and that's, and I'll be honest, that's rare. I, I wish I could say every week, yeah, you know, the Lord gives me the opportunity to lead someone to Christ, but it's, and, and I don't even keep track because I, I you know, I don't want to, you know, you know, say, you know, put a notch on my belt, but it, it's been very few that, that I've, you know, had actually been on the, you know, the one that's seeing the fruit drop in. And it's, and it's not, you know, we like Paul says, I watered a pot or I planted a polis water, God gave the increase. We might just plant a seed. We might not be the one that actually sees the harvest. Or someone else, you know, 20 other people did all the hard work and we just happen to be there to catch the apple when it falls off the tree. You know, it, it's um there's there's very few, in my opinion, in my experience, very few who actually are in the process of the, the harvesting most of us are the the workers the, the planters the waterers the ones that are tilling the soil um and i mean i'm i'm fine with that i you know i i can plant seeds i can water and if god you know he grants me the privilege of being the one there to, to, to do the final uh harvesting you know that's great all glory to god it's god's the one that gives the increase so i don't know if that if that helps if that's encouraging or not you know our our, we're not, uh, you know, our success is not based on whether or not we see someone come to Christ. It's whether or not we're just sharing the gospel. You know, I, I can't control how somebody responds. I, I know I, as a, as a new believer, I, that used to frustrate me thinking, okay, what am I doing wrong? Why is, why, you know, I thought I'm going to go out there and share the gospel. I'm going to get everybody saved. Well, it, it didn't happen, you know, so, more often yeah exactly that's my thought too you know i feel like oh my goodness we're in this neighborhood and what am i here for even if it's the job that i'm working in you know it's not to get the salary that's a byproduct but we're yeah. here for kingdom purpose you know yeah, yeah. and my heart burns for you know all the co-workers that yeah. don't know him that don't have a relationship with him and you want to see them you know come to christ you don't want to see them in hell one day right yeah. so yeah. um but then you also like you try and you you 
share things, but you know, for the most part, it's like it's not received like you know with excitement right. or anything. Or sometimes you don't even hear anything at all. Like you know, yeah. it's silence. Yeah. So, um, so I was just wondering, am I doing something wrong yeah. here, or is yeah. it like a different approach to take, or I'm not yeah. sure. No. what the deal is you know no, so you're probably doing everything right yeah i mean look at look at jesus he, he he never made a mistake and look how he the response he got he he didn't get all that many uh followers did he more, more people rejected him than not now he did you know there were more than you and i probably will ever will ever see come to trust in him but there, he had an awful lot that that rejected him so yeah yeah don't don't get discouraged that you know it's it's not it's not that you're doing anything wrong it's just that's people's hearts there a lot of people have, have hard hearts and sometimes you know it's just not time yet yeah the lord you know we we plant the seed and maybe that seed lies dormant and you know 10 years from now um the you know someone will come along to water or maybe they'll go through a difficult time like he's brother and that's the time when the Lord really, the Holy Spirit works in their heart and they, and they bring to mind, he, the Holy Spirit brings to mind something maybe that you said to them 10 years ago. Um, you, you know, we never know. Just you know, so don't let the, you know, don't let the enemy discourage you. Cause I, I know I've been in that boat where all oh, I'm, what am I doing wrong? Why, why am I not convincing this person, you know, uh, to, to believe in Jesus, but you know, we can't argue anybody into the kingdom. It's, you know, their heart has to be prepared and, and God, the Holy Spirit has to do it. Right. Thanks, Jim, for sharing that. It makes me feel better. Yep. Great. Yep. Yeah. Just keep plant, sowing and watering and trust God for his time. Yep. Uh, I'll, I'll watch her another, maybe this will be encouraging. Um, it was one of our co-workers that he, he passed away, went to be with the Lord. It's, it's been quite a while, while now, probably 15 years ago. But anyway, when I, when I was first saved, um, I, he was one of the first people I shared the gospel with and, and he was somewhat receptive, but after a while, I was like, yeah, well, yeah, that's nice. You know, that works for you. And, and, uh, we, we, and so we, we didn't really have any additional converse, spiritual conversation after a while because he was, you know, got tired of hearing it. And I thought, well, okay, I've done, you know, I've, told you the gospel it's up to you and and years later probably probably 10 years later he came down with uh, cancer um and it was it ended up being terminal and um and i i, I went and visited him while while he was sick and so forth and finally about probably about a week it was getting he was getting close to his deathbed and, and i called him up and and uh and i I think I said something like, you know, I have to ask you, what did I say? I, I said, there's one question I have to ask you. And before I even got a chance to, to ask a question, he, he said, he said, I accepted Christ. He said, I'm ready to go. And I, oh, I wow. Praise so, God. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you never know my 10, 20 years later. Um, yeah, someone might come to know the Lord just because all you did was plant a seed. I mean, all you did. I mean, just because you planted a seed. So, yeah, so don't get discouraged. Okay. All right. All right. So where were we? Um, oh, yeah, Mark's version about, yeah, whoever believes and is baptized, and that would be the, the baptism that Acts 1 is talking about, the, the Holy Spirit, when you, when you believe and when it's, and that's, and I think the reason Mark puts that in there, um, if you recall, our, um, in when we were studying John, in John chapter 2, when Jesus, when it's the end of chapter 2, after Jesus had performed some works there, he turned water into wine. It's, it said that many saw the works and they believed, but Jesus did not entrust himself to them because he knew what's in their heart. Um, in other words, you know, you can believe intellectually, but until you've there's a difference between believing all the facts about Jesus and truly trusting in him. So I think that's why Mark puts that in, because um, if you, if you continue on in the study of Acts, there were some where, do you remember, is it Mark, is it Acts? I forget which chapter it is. It might be chapter eight or 10, where 
Paul was, I think it was Paul was talking to them and they, he said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we didn't even, we don't even know anything about the Holy Spirit. So then I think he said, Paul laid hands on them. And I think he said he baptized them in the name of Jesus. And then they did receive the Holy Spirit. So I think that's what Mark is referring to here, believe and baptize. So you have to believe not just intellectually, but uh, in, with your heart. And you'll be baptized by the Holy Spirit, and that's what's going to save you when it's when it's, when you truly trust in Jesus and not just believe the facts. So is that is that making sense? And it'd be like that that encounter in in Acts where once they did truly believe, they did receive the Holy Spirit. They were baptized into the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that's Mark's version of the instructions that were to do while Jesus is gone, and in John's version john chapter 20 and, and it's interesting how you, know, you put all these pieces together when you go to each different account i think jesus i think he gave one set of instructions but each gospel writer just recorded a portion of it so if you look at matthew mark luke and john plus acts and put all the pieces together to these instructions that jesus gave them right before he ascended back to heaven so in you know matthew's version he's Matthew only recorded the part where Jesus said, make disciples. Mark recorded the part where you preach the gospel and people have to believe and be baptized. Um, Luke recorded the part where you have to repent in order to receive forgiveness in Jesus' name. And then John is going to say something slightly different. John chapter 20 is looking at starting at verse 21, 21 through 23. This is where Jesus is given the instructions uh, to, to through John. I mean, this is where John is recording Jesus's instructions, what I was trying to say. And so John 20, verse 21 through 23, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, I also send you. So he, that, that's where he's saying, I'm sending you out the same way the father sent me. Um, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts say, say, basically, I'm sending you to be my witnesses. So John records, I'm sending you, and he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, remember, in Luke, the exact same account in Luke, he says, wait until you receive power from on high. Wait until you receive the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 says, you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So I think what John's saying here, I think he's giving them a, rather than, you know, Rather than saying it the way Luke did, or rather rather than recording it the way Luke did, where Luke said, wait until you receive that power, Jesus, John records that Jesus is giving, I think, a, giving like a physical illustration. He breathed on them, uh, breath, that's pneuma, same word for spirit, which is pneuma. I think he's giving them like a, an illustration, a physical illustration, breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, referring to what's going to happen you know, 40 days or 50 days from now, I guess it would be 40 days, whatever it was, 50 days. So I think that's what he's saying there. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, which is going to happen not many days from now. Same thing that Luke 24 and Acts 1 says. So he's saying, I'm sending you as the Father, and he's saying, receive the Holy Spirit. And then verse 23, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they have they have not been forgiven. And I think what he's saying there is he's giving us the authority to tell anyone, if you believe in Jesus, you will receive forgiveness. If you don't believe in Jesus, you won't receive forgiveness. Similar to what he said in, in Mark, if you believe and are baptized, you'll be saved. If you don't believe, you're going to be condemned. This is just a different way of saying it in John. If you believe in Jesus, you will be forgiven. If you don't believe in Jesus, you won't be forgiven. Similar to what uh, what Luke twenty four said, you know, repentance for forgiveness of sins in the name in the name of Jesus. So if you repent and believe, you receive forgiveness. If you don't repent and believe, you won't receive forgiveness. Does that does that make sense? So so yeah, that's I think that's what uh, what John means by that, and and similar to what Paul said in Second Corinthians. Five, that'll be the, and that that's going to tie us back into Daniel twelve when we get there. Second Second Corinthians chapter five is you could call this the gospel according to Paul if you want to. Um, Second Corinthians five 
starting at verse 17. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we probably all have that one memorized, where he says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is past, the new has come. That's when, we're, when we believe we're born again, we become a new creation, we receive the Holy Spirit. And then all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So the ministry of reconciliation, that's basically the, the same thing as the Great Commission, go out and claim the gospel. And he's going to tell us, here's what that is. Here's what that ministry of reconciliation is that we're to, to proclaim to the world. Verse 19, namely, this is that ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ, reconciling the whole world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us this word of reconciliation. Okay, so God is reconciling the whole world to himself in Christ, not counting your sins against us, against them. And he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. So in verse 20, we're his ambassadors, we're his representatives for Christ, as though God was entreating us, entreating them through us. We beg you, we plead with you on, be, on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. So that's the Great Commission from, from Paul's perspective. We're, to, we're begging people, we're pleading with them to be reconciled to God. We're saying that God has reconciled you through Christ. Now you're to be reconciled. And that might seem like a contradiction, but um, you know, if you've ever had an accounting class, you know, what, what does it mean when you reconcile the books? And anybody, what would, what's it mean to reconcile the books? They're uh, appro uh, uh, pr approved. They're um, balanced. Uh, balanced, yeah. Balanced. They're balanced. balanced. Yeah, the books are yeah. balanced. They Checks they, out. They check out. Yeah, they check out. They, the amount due, the amount paid equals the amount due, right? The balance is zero. And so that's what uh, verse 19 and 20 are saying. God is saying, you have been, the world has been reconciled through Christ. The amount we owe is the, the amount Jesus paid is the amount that we owe. We owed God an unpayable amount, right? Matthew 18 says it was like 120,000 years wages. It's, it's an infinite amount. And Jesus paid that infinite amount. So God says, you're reconciled. The amount due, the amount paid equals the amount due. Uh, remember when John 19, when Jesus cried out on the cross, one of his last words, you remember what he said? said it is finished the telestai yeah telestai and you know what that word means it has two two meanings uh it is finished yeah and it's uh, paid in full paid in full paid in full that's it thank you paid in full amen so when jesus cried out to telestai it is finished paid in full yeah that's and that's that's what was stamped on a on a bill back in biblical times to telestai paid in full that's that's what he's saying here in in 2 Corinthians 5, 19, paid in full, saying that to the whole world, your bill is paid in full, you're reconciled. Now, Paul, we're to go out and beg people, be reconciled to God. We have to agree with God that our bill is paid in full, right? We have to agree with him that I have a, I owe you a debt that's unpayable. I can't, I can't pay my debt. Lord, I'm, I'm a wretched sinner. It's going to take me eternity in hell to pay that bill, or I can accept your payment. Jesus paid it in full. When we accept that, God says, you're reconciled. Books are balanced. My ledger matches your ledger. You're reconciled, paid in full. And then he says, we become the righteousness of God in him in verse 21. Go ahead, Sandra. Um, yeah, this just reminds me of like, I mean, um, very recently, my sister in India actually, um, she directed a video like she they made this video for their for the church there um it's actually in the indian language hindi but it does have um the meaning of the words um in brackets in english um but it was just really nice talking about um you know the the concept of how god jesus paid in full mm. for us um it's just wonderful. It's a wonderful um, story. Part of it is actually based on a real um, story testimony too. And mm. um, but I can I can share that with yeah. um, with you all. I'd, I'd love to see. Um, yeah. yeah, I was very blessed seeing it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is actually the that fellow I was telling you about a week or so ago. This is actually the passage that 
God used to convict him um, of his need to re receive Christ's righteousness. Um, we, we first looked at Romans 5, Romans 5, or 510 in particular, where it says we were, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. How much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? And we'd, we'd first we'd looked at Matthew 5, where Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, he, and he gives some examples. You know, you heard thou shalt not murder. But I say, if you're angry with your brother, you're guilty. If you even call someone a fool, you're in danger of the fires of hell. So, you know, that that's that's um, to, to answer your, one of your questions earlier, Sandra, about, you know, um, about sharing the gospel and leading someone to Christ. Um, Matthew 5 is a good place to bring conviction to someone, someone who thinks, well, you know, I'm not that bad or I'm a good person. In you know, Matthew 5, if anybody can say they've never been angry with a brother, never called someone a fool, um, well, then they're also a liar too, if they can say that. But uh, but that that's, Matthew 5 I th is, I mean, that brings, that brought conviction to me and I know it's brought conviction to others. So, you know, a person's heart, heart that's part of the, the harvesting process. That's part of the preparing the soil. You know, our heart has to be prepared. We have to realize that we're a sinner first before we're willing to accept Christ's payment. So Matthew 5 is, is, has been a good place to, to bring conviction to show someone they're a sinner. And then the second Corinthians five, once they realize they're a sinner, second Corinthians five is a good place to, to follow up with that because, Matthew 5 says your your righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. Well, okay, how am I going to do that? I, you know, I, I haven't been able to not be angry with my brother. And what do I do with this sin? So 2 Corinthians 5, 19 through 21 shows us how we our righteousness can exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. When we are reconciled to God, believing that Jesus paid it all. And in verse 21, he says, Christ knew no sin. He became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So we exchange all of our sin. Jesus takes all of our sin and we receive all of his righteousness. So that's how we our righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. We receive Christ's righteousness as a free gift. And so that that's what God used to bring conviction to that fellow last week. Now, I'm not saying that's the, you know, the the uh pattern, the, you know, that that it's gonna work for every person, but this person that's that's how what god used and and that ties in with with daniel 12 verse 3 when that we were uh, the verse that we were working on looking at today when he says those that have insight will lead many to righteousness this is how you lead someone to righteousness it's christ's righteousness not you know it's not uh that's the only righteousness that's going to save is christ's righteousness in there in second corinthians 5 21 we, we become the righteousness of God in him. So we lead someone to righteousness when we share the gospel with them and they trust Jesus and receive his righteousness as a free gift. So does that, that make sense? Yes. Okay, good. All right. And, and another illustration, I, I don't know if I've shared this illustration with you before or not. It, it's been effective as far as righteous the righteousness that saves when remember when jesus said in matthew 5 that same sermon on the mount when he says he, he ended that matthew 5 uh, in the middle he says your righteousness must ex exceed that of the scribes and pharisees and then the very last verse matthew 5 48 he says you therefore you must be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect and an illustration that that goes well with that is and I, maybe i've shared it before but i'll share it again um, you know, it's like taking your final exam in college and the teacher gives you this test. There's a thousand questions on it. And he says, you must be perfect in order to pass this test. You have to get all 1000 questions correct. Um, and, but there's only ever been one person in history that got all 1000 correct. If you get all 1000 correct, you pass. If you miss one, you fail and pass, you go to heaven, fail, you spend eternity in hell. So if I'm going to give you a a choice you can take this test yourself and try to get all 1000 correct if you do it you'll pass if you don't you're going to go to hell and remind you there's only one person that's ever uh passed this test so i'm going to give you a, another option if you don't want to take a chance on passing taking answering all these questions perfectly yourself i'm, I'm going to let you uh 
receive the score from the person, the one person who took this and never missed a question. And that's what basically what God is giving us the option for. He says, you can, you can try to pass this test of life on yourself, but every single moment of your life, you've got to be perfect. You commit one sin from the moment you're born to your last breath, you're going to fail and you're going to spend eternity in hell. Or you can accept the test score of Jesus. He lived a perfect sinless life. You'll be credited with his perfect righteousness. So that that's a, an illustration that might be effective for someone as well. Um, most of us, when we see it that way, say, okay, I know I can't live a perfect life, so I'm going to accept the free gift that Jesus offers. I'm going to accept his perfect righteousness. So does that, does that help at all? All right. So, all right. So that takes us back to that. It's a good tie in with Daniel 12. Daniel 12, verse 3. If you recall, Daniel 12, verse 1 was Michael takes, he takes a stand. That we saw that in Revelation 12. He, when he had that battle, Satan was cast out time of distress which has never occurred before and your people everyone found written in the book will be rescued that's going to be at the end we're all going to be rescued and then he talks about verses verse two there he talks about the resurrection he says there's going to be a time your people are going to be rescued many who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake these to everlasting life the one he's talking about the ones that in the book of life they're going to be rescued. They're going to be resurrected to everlasting life. But the others, the ones who are not written in the book, they're going to be resurrected to disgrace and everlasting contempt. And in verse 3, those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Okay, so that's everyone who's written in the book, the book of life. They're going to be resurrected to everlasting life. And, and it's because, well, I'm not going to say it's because, it's because of trusting in Jesus, but a result of that is because a result of that is that we will lead many to righteousness. We'll have insight. We receive insight when we're saved. We receive the Holy Spirit. He gives us insight. Jesus is our wisdom. And as a result of being saved, we're going to go out and we're going to share the gospel. We're going to lead many to righteousness, that, that righteousness that Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians 5.21. That's not what saves us by leading others to righteousness, but that's a result. This good news that we've received, we, we go out, we can't help but share it with others. We lead them to righteousness as well. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. And so that those that resurrection there in verse two, we have to, yeah, well, we're about out of time today, but next week we'll look at that a little more there's there's two different resurrections there's the resurrection to eternal life and there's the res resurrection to disgrace and everlasting contempt and just as a little uh primer for next week it's described several different places it's described in revelation 20 that first resurrection in revelation 5 uh revelation 20 verse 4 is the resurrection of those whose names are written in the book of life that's the resurrection to everlasting life. The second one in Revelation 20, verse 5, is a thousand years later. That's the resurrection to disgrace and everlasting contempt. And uh, John 5 talks about that as well. And we'll look at this more next week. John 5 talks about a resurrection to life and a resurrection to judgment. Revelation 20, verse 4 is the resurrection to life for all those that are in the book of life, all those that are saved. And then the resurrection to judgment is the one at, in Revelation 20, verse 5, and then 11 through 15, that, that great white throne judgment. But but we don't have time to cover that today. That'll be that'll be next week, the two resurrections. So, all right. So anybody have anything else to share? Any what what's our lesson for today that all that we can take with us this week? Be a witness on earth. Yeah. Yeah, be a witness. Go out and 
share the gospel, tell what you've seen and experienced. Yeah. I guess keep trying, even if you aren't received well. Yeah. Um, because it, it it was nice to understand that you know Jesus was rejected too, so we shouldn't feel so bad. We should just keep witnessing and and Amen. doing what we were put on the earth to do. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Donette. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say the same thing as Donette. And it's always nice when we can come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, because sometimes the enemy makes you feel like mm -hmm. you're isolated, you know. And um, when we um, share with each other, it makes you feel like, oh, you're not the only one. Everybody mm -hmm. is in this together. Yeah. Yeah. People. Yeah. You don't feel defeated. We have each other yeah. to, to yeah. lift yeah. each other up and to keep going. Yeah. Right. So thank you. Yeah, thank yeah, you. thanks, group. I appreciate thank that you. comments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate the encouragement. I need it as much as anybody. And when, as the two of you were talking, I was thinking about you know Elijah. I remember when he was getting discouraged? He said, "Lord, I'm I'm the only one left." And you know, you feel like you're out on an island. You're you're the only one out there. But you know, Lord said, "You know, I I reserved for myself." What do you say? How many thousand that have not? the need of bail so yeah we're not we're not alone so yeah i appreciate all of you i appreciate the encouragement you you provide so all right somebody like to pray for us sure i will thanks andrew father god we thank you um for one another thank you for connecting us in the first place and thank you for bringing this group um so long um we're, we're still digging into your word and um learning so much and we thank you father for um helping each other grow encouraging each other and um we thank you for your holy spirit and all of us and um which is why we can we can be um united um and um we pray father that you will um, continue to give us those open doors, divine opportunities, um, and um, help us to have the spirit of obedience in us to follow you. And um, um, we pray for um, courage and strength and um, boldness in that moment and um, just a leaning and trusting in you that you will give us um, the right things to say and um, um, also um, that our actions will display you um, so that we will represent you well um, to those around us, that they will um, be so attracted to know more um, about you and not just about you, but they will want to have a relationship with you, Lord. And uh, we'll see souls not only just coming to you, but staying with you. And um, uh, we pray, Father, that um, you'll help us in this journey to make more disciples for you. Um, and um, a lot of times we don't know how, but um, we pray, Father, that you will. Um, we um, ask you, Holy Spirit, to be our helper because you are always our helper and our time of need is all the time. Um, so we thank you, Father, for um, your word. Thank you for Jim and uh, Mark and Donette and all those who couldn't make it too. We come at them in your care and we pray for um, them to um, return in um, getting together and um, diving into your word. Um, we ask all these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Sandra. Amen. Thanks, okay. Sandra. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Appreciate the encouragement. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go out and testify. We are witnesses. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Blessings to all of you. Thank you.